This video is going to focus on the natural factors that have changed climate in the past. So far you've seen a lot of evidence that supports climate change. However, we have not yet discussed what has caused that change. By the time you're done watching this video, you should be able to listen and describe the natural causes of climate change and discuss, discuss how each variable changes climate here on Earth. That second part is the most important part, being able to discuss how each variable changes climate here on Earth. Now specifically, we are going to focus on the changing positions of continents, Milankovitch cycles, volcanic eruptions, and changes in solar output. Now so far, scientists have been able to describe how these five natural factors can impact or change an area's climate. Now in most cases, these factors change climate on a global scale, so wide-reaching effects. For example, you've already seen how El Nino and La Nina can impact the entire Pacific Ocean Basin. The other four factors act uh, on the same type of scale. Now, if you think back to, you know, 200 plus million years ago when Pangaea was around, climate all over the Earth was very different. Places that are on the coast now were probably landlocked. There was an entirely different set of mountain ranges, continents were at different latitudes, and there was only one gigantic ocean. Think of how the ocean currents would have worked then. Take time to pause the video and answer the blue question you see on the screen in your notes. Now, you should have remembered that if you change your latitude, you change the amount of either direct or indirect sunlight. Mountains, on the other hand, can change your climate depending on if you're on the windward or leeward side of the mountain. And ocean currents can either bring warm or cool air to, to your location, like the California or Gulf Current. Minnesota is a great example of how climate can change based on your position. During the Permian in Minnesota, it was located closer to the equator and was still landlocked, but now, in the Permian, it was at the horse latitudes. Now, if you think back to everything you know about lame cow, during this time, you, should, you, you might expect Minnesota to have a warmer, drier climate with extreme temperature swings. As the continents move, the climate factors change, changing the overall climate. By the time Minnesota reaches its present location, it has moved to a higher latitude, and a different wind belt system altogether. Both of these factors combine to help create the climate that Minnesota currently has and you know we all love. Now this video that's linked to this slide contains a National Geographic video that describes the impacts of Milankovitch cycles. The video itself is link, linked into my Moodle page and I highly recommend that you watch the video, video several times. Uh, it has wonderful models that help explain each part or each characteristic of all the Milankovitch cycles. So if you need to, go watch it. It's a great video. Okay, so you know that the Earth orbits the Sun. You may not know that the shape of Earth's orbit is constantly changing. It's changing very slowly, making one complete change every 100,000 years, but it is changing. The orbit changes from being more elliptical, and elliptical just means oval in shape, and that's what we kind of have right now, to a more circular orbit. Now the reason for this change is the gravitational attraction between the Earth, Sun, Jupiter, and Saturn. Now the important thing to remember here, guys, is that when Earth has a more circular shape, the differences in seasons decreases, meaning summer and winter, to te winter temperature ranges would be smaller. Now right now we have larger temperature ranges between summer and winter and part of the reason uh, for that is the Earth's elliptical orbit. Earth's tilt also changes continuously. It can go from not having much of a tilt at all, you know approximately 21.8 degrees, to having more of a tilt at 24.4 degrees. Again, this is a very slow process taking about 41,000 years to go from one extreme to the other and then back again. The Earth kind of nods up and down to the Sun, 
When the Earth has a low angle of tilt, the poles are receiving indirect sunlight most of the year, meaning ice can grow. That's really important. Ice grows during low tilt. Whereas uh, when the Earth has a greater tilt, the poles are getting more direct sunlight, which means that the ice can now melt. This, also, this factor also makes seasons either more stable or more extreme, depending on how great or little the tilt is. The Earth is like a ginormous spinning top. If you ever played with a top, you should remember that they always seem to wobble a little bit, no matter how fast you spin them. Now, one reason for this is their shape. Most tops are slightly bigger in the middle. The Earth is the, the same way. It kind of bulges in the middle a little bit. Because of this, the Earth also wobbles on its axis as it spins. This process takes about 23,000 years to complete a full cycle, and it also causes changes in the Earth's climate. Right now, we are pointed away from the sun when we are closest to it, and we are pointing towards the sun when we are furthest from it. As Earth wobbles on its axis, on its axis, you know, the point where we're pointing is going to change. So in the future, we will point towards the sun when we are closest to it, and that's going to make our summers extremely hot, and point it away from the sun when we are furthest from it, from it, making our winters even more bitterly cold. I know you're really excited for that. All in all, each individual factor, tilt, wobble, shape of our orbit does not have a huge impact on our climate. However, when we put all of them together working in combination, they create climate change that can cause glaciers to either grow or melt. This cycle usually occurs every 100,000 years. Now, hopefully that number rings a bell. You should remember that CO2 concentrations and temperature change uh, on the same 100,000 year cycle. And this is no coincidence, guys. The Milankovitch cycles that we've just talked about have been given credit for the pattern that we see in temperature and CO2. Now this is just a good diagram, shows you all the different uh, parts of the Milankovitch cycles. I would take a look at this a few times so you can kind of see what's going on. Um, this webpage right here is linked into my Moodle page. Uh, you can take a look at it. It helps kind of reinforce what we've talked about, gives you a little bit more detail. So if you're kind of into this thing, uh, take a look at that. It's a good web page. I'm going to get into volcanoes. Volcanoes can also help naturally change climate, and they do so in different ways with different results. Now, hopefully you remember that volcanoes are usually associated with plate boundaries, in particular, convergent plate boundaries. When plate, when plate tectonics is really, really active, so are the volcanoes. Volcanoes are kind of like Earth's natural burping mechanism. Yes, I did say burp. Uh, there are so many uh, stored up gases inside the Earth that sometimes those gases need to get out. When volcanoes erupt, they release these gases into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide and water vapor are some of the main gases released during volcanic eruptions. You already know that both of these gases are greenhouse gases which have the potential to increase global temperatures. Now volcanoes, as you know, also erupt ash and dust and other things like sulfates, which uh, can in turn help create clouds or black out the sun, which then cools the atmosphere. So volcanoes can do both cooling and warming. Now this diagram gives you an idea of um, major volcanic eruptions like Krakatoa um, and Pinatubo. So uh, what you can see is when we have these big massive eruptions, temperature, the blue line, goes where? Well, it goes down. Okay, so you can kind of see uh, how volcanoes and temperatures are related. Now, last thing we're going to talk about is changes in solar output. You know, the sun is radiating energy, releasing energy into the universe all the time. However, the thing is, is that it's not always constant. Okay, so what we, can, we see down here at the very bottom is sun's energy output, and it's changing ever so slightly. Um, and it's measured in watts, which is our, our unit for energy. And we can see that the energy emitted goes up and goes down and up again. Usually it's about 11 years 
between the maximums. And the temperature here on Earth kind of follows or mirrors that slightly, right? When we see an increase down here, we see an increase up here. Okay, increase, increase. However, something a little bit different about this one right here is that the overall trend is increasing. Okay, now what's happening in this graph is we have a uh, total number of sunspots in yellow, CO2 in blue, and temperatures in red. Okay, the sunspots kind of help us with that solar output, you know, Lots of sunspots, little sunspots re re relate to the amount of energy being released by the sun. Okay, so we can see this is overall, you know, up, down, up, down. Temperatures kind of follow that. However, what you should notice is that the CO2 input and the uh, temperature lines do something different than the sunspots. Sunspots remain pretty constant throughout, whereas both the CO2 and temperature are increasing. And that kind of gets us to the human or anthropogenic climate change. So that's it for this video. Watch it as many times as you need. Good luck, guys.